Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Wally Cost. I'm with the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office Division of Emergency Management. I would like to welcome you to the Whatcom Unified Emergency Operations Center and uh, glad that you're all here today. As far as what we're going to do today, I'm going to bring uh, John Gargett uh, up in just a second. Uh, he is the Deputy Director for the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office Division of Emergency Management and also Liz Coogan, who is the City of Bellingham's Emergency Manager. And the thing there is so that you know who you're dealing with if you were to call over here or want more information, we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to know who they are as well. Uh, the purpose of this meeting, we'll talk a little bit about that, and then we're going to go into the actual uh, you know, conversation, and I kind of look at it as a conversation. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Cascadia Subduction Zone, and we're going to start out with a broad picture. We're going to start actually where it's located, because that's the first step. Uh, we'll move into the state after we hear a little bit about what that looks like. We'll move into the interior of the state or western Washington and how a Cascadia event could affect that. And then after we're done with that, we're going to move up into uh, the – and let me introduce the people at the same time. Uh, Dante DeSabatino is going to be from the Washington State Emergency Management Division to talk about that. We'll have Dan Banks. He's going to be presenting from the Washington State Department of Transportation. He's going to be doing that online virtually today from Olympia. Uh, after that, we're going to move down to uh, Whatcom County. Andy Weiser from the Whatcom County P Planning and Development Services, who's a geologist there. He'll be sharing with us about Whatcom County, some of the neat, unique geological features of the county and why it's such uh, or it could be problematic. We're also going to touch a little bit on, uh, you know, one of the things after a disaster or something like that happens, the first thing is we need to reopen ports. And, of course, one of the first things is they look at the airport. We'll get the airport over and start flying things in. Uh, it doesn't quite work that quickly, and uh, we have uh, uh, Alex Young from Bellingham International to speak to that. And Norm Smith is here from the Port of Bellingham, where he's the emergency manager and security officer, to talk a little bit about the port because – there's another side. We can bring lots of cargo in from through the port. The only thing is it's got to transition up the strait, and there are some things to be concerned about there. And uh, Norm's going to tell us what processes they go through when they have to uh, reevaluate or evaluate the port itself. I'll be giving a little bit of a presentation from Public Works. They're unable to be with us today, so they did send some information over, so I'll go through that. At this time, I would like to invite uh, John Gargett, I mentioned, the uh, Deputy Director for the Wat Wat Whatcom County Sheriff's Office Division of Emergency Management, and Liz Coogan to say a few words from their perspective. So, John, Liz. Well, thank you, Wally. Uh, appreciate it, and thank you all for coming today. I think you're going to find it informative. Um, I know Wally's been working on this for a long time. Um, in some ways, I do want to recognize this is kind of Wally's capstone. He retires at the end of the month, so we really appreciate all the work he's done over the last few years. <laughs> but he really has been really concerned uh, for a number of years and working on what would the impacts be to us realistically if we did have uh, a Cascadia-type event. Uh, for those of you that were around in 2016 when we did the Cascadia Rising exercise, we did spend a lot of time with both USGS as well as Department of Transportation um, on analyzing the infrastructure, potential infrastructure damages for that type of an quake, or as Andy will point out, another quake which could occur around here, the uh, Boulder Creek Fault. So we'll be talking about those today. <clears throat> I think the important thing to remember with these is when you look at it from the modeling perspective, when you look at it as what could the worst case scenario be, what you realize is we're all going to die. <laughs> but <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's the way a lot of people come away from the presentations on the potential effects. But the reality is, and I can tell you this, having spent 40 years now working around the world in disasters, you know, whether it was the Loma Prieta earthquake, which worked on Indonesian earthquake and tsunami, Japanese earthquake and tsunami, as well as a number of others, um, <coughs> Northridge earthquake, um, it's not really known what actually will happen. Um, there's tremendous damage in one part of town like Mexico City in 86, you know, there'd be completely collapsed buildings, and next to it, it'd be fine. Absolutely no problem. 
So we're going to have to see what actually happens afterwards. However, uh, the modeling that's been done by everybody from USGS to Washington Geology um, for both tsunami and earthquake is at least a baseline that we can use to take a look and say, okay, if this is the worst case, these are the things we can expect, then you can begin to do your planning. And I think that's the thing you want to keep in mind. I, I, I always get overwhelmed when I, when I look at the models and I go, well, wait a minute. There was no tsunami here after the Alaskan earthquake in 64, but the modeling shows that we're going to have a big tsunami from the same earthquake if it occurred today. So what changed? I don't know. But what we're doing is looking at the models and saying this has the potential for doing that, not necessarily that it's the fact that that's what will happen. So with that, I again uh, look forward to the presentation, Wally. Thank you for your time. I'll turn it over to Liz for a few comments. Hello, I'm Liz Coogan. I'm the Emergency Manager with Bellingham Fire Department, and um, we are co-located here with the county. And the very nature of emergency is the element of the unknown, right? Like, we, we don't know exactly what will happen, so we plan and prepare and do our best to make educated guesses, and then when things fall apart, we pull in extra resources to try to respond to the need, and that's what happened with the COVID response. We brought in people from city departments and county departments and other um, local agencies in Bellingham, and we worked together. And this facility, this floor was full of people and a lot of people working from home too, trying to pull resources and respond. So um, we expect that the element of the unknown will be the challenge and we will work together to try to resolve it. Thank you, Lon John and Liz. So why have this conversation? I'm sure that's been on a lot of people's mind. The answer is three and a half months ago, I was sitting at the uh, Washington State Emergency Management uh, Association's annual conference, and uh, one of the presenters came forward and talked about how they were talking to some of the distribution centers uh, down in the Seattle area about what would happen if there was a cascade, Cascadia subduction uh, earthquake and uh, whether they would get product, whether they would be able to send product out. And of course that led to a presentation on there's going to be a period of time when there probably won't be distribution if this were to happen uh, as it plays out. Uh, for us living here in Whatcom County, I think it's one of the things to look at. We do not have a direct uh, route across the mountains to the east side of the Cascades. Uh, to do anything, we have to go south. And then that leads to the next question as well, if we have to go south, but uh, the transportation routes are affected, what actually will get down there and what actually will come up here? And that's what kind of left me with saying, you know what, we should have this conversation. We should do the presentation. We're actually recording this so that we can make it available to other businesses and things after this, but that's what we're after today is to, to do exactly that. I think over the past 10 years we've had you know, little glimpses of what it might look like if uh, we had some problems. Last year, uh, about a year ago, we had the flooding, and of course there was a landslide on I-5 that uh, shut things down for over 24 hours, both lanes. So that was inconvenient for a lot of people, delayed things. Uh, on Highway 9, which is the only other avenue we have directly out of the county, uh, the uh, river water undercut some of the uh, Highway 9, so there was a section of that was closed. So. Basically, truck traffic and things coming out of Canada ended up going over to Interstate 5 and then down, so we lost one of our routes for a little while. So that's something there. We've also seen, uh, for example, uh, I, I hate to use the, uh, the Oso because there was such a loss of life there, but Highway 530 was actually shut down for 10 weeks as they cleaned that up. So. We've had little bits and glimpses of what a uh, closed uh, uh, transportation route might look like, and with the Cascadia event, it could be even larger as, as we've, uh, we're gonna hear today. You know, John Wooden once said that, uh, don't let what you can't do stop from what you can do, and this is kind of our first step. We're taking that first step to say, we can have this conversation to discuss exactly that. Over the past six years, John mentioned about the 2016 Cascadia uh, exercise. 
there were a lot of lessons learned then. Uh, you'll actually see a presentation a little bit later, a video uh, that was taken speaking about that. But from that, there were a lot of lessons learned. There's been a lot of studies that have been done. And uh, all of that information is your information. You know, bottom line is you bought and paid for it. <laughs> so we want to get that information out to you so that you can make de decisions, business decisions, decisions for your family, how to be prepared, and that's part of what this is. Uh, this past summer, they finished up with a second uh, national level exercise, Cascadia Rising once again. It's important enough to FEMA and important enough to the state of Washington as well as several other states that they do these national level exercises to find out what is our response, where are the seams and gaps, and we need to tighten them up. But I do want to read one thing from the report, and it's so timely. It just came out three days ago, but it's a prelude to the actual after action report. And so I'm just going to go ahead and read uh, what, uh, what was put in there. So if you'll bear with me on that. A Cascadia subduction zone 9.0 magnitude event will cause significant damage to aerial, maritime, and railroad infrastructure, supply chain, embarkation and debarkation points, and surface infrastructure throughout western Washington. The disruption to surface transportation infrastructure will prevent the movement of public and private delivery of traditional and bulk goods and resources to support uh, impact or isolated communities and people with access and functional needs. So again, that just came out, and I think that's important uh, so that you know that after these exercises are done, they put together these after action reports, and that's why we're you know, here today to talk a little bit about preparedness and move forward. I took some numbers because I don't know that we have a real clear picture of what traffic moves up and down the I-5 corridor. Uh, talking to uh, some Customs and Border Protection, they showed me some open source information, and this gives you a sense of what crosses our border up at Blaine, Linden, and uh, over at Sumas in a, in a given year. Uh, truck crossings are over 540,000 for the last four years. Uh, obviously, we have a low number for the 2023 fiscal year to date, which starts October 1st, but there's plenty of time to raise that. <laughs> so, but you're talking about a lot of truck traffic, and then the reality is, well, what about the traffic going north? Uh, you're looking at another 2,000 to 2,300 trucks per day between the three crossings. So a lot of traffic goes north and south, whether taking product to somewhere or bringing inputs and product down. That's an important number. And again, as you hear the rest of the presentation, keep these kinds of numbers in mind. You probably didn't know that uh, Whatcom County does not have any landfills. Uh, everything has to be moved out either by truck or rail. And when you look at the amount of uh, uh, solid waste that's moved out right now, over 182,000 tons per year. Uh, put another way, uh, 30 tons per container, you're talking about over 6,000 containers that are moving up and down the I-5 corridor, including what's on the trains. Now picture that you lost your infrastructure to move that. <laughs> so that's another reason why we're having this uh, discussion today. And I also wanted to include some of the port, uh, both the Bellingham International Airport as well as the Port of Bellingham. They too are moving passengers and cars, uh, passengers and cargo uh, back and forth. Not to the extent necessarily that we see with the truck traffic by any means, but when you talk about those numbers, you can see an impact on any of those will have an impact on all of us. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more because one of the first things that happens is there's always this transition to look at one of the other modes of transportation to move things. Not quite that easy, <laughs> and we're going to see that. Uh, so I'll just leave that at that. Uh, as we transition into earthquakes, I'm going to keep this very simple <laughs> because you can spend three or four hours talking about the different types of earthquakes and what can happen. The bottom line is there's going to be two blocks of earth that are going to come together and they're going to rub. And they're going to rub in a way that's going to cause the ground shaking. Dante is going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we also know that there's the volcanic types of uh, earthquakes. Uh, as magma pushes its way towards the top, there are tremors and things like that that give indications. But nevertheless, what we're concerned about is what about the, the rocking or the sudden thrust of earth, uh, one block against another? And we'll talk about that. Uh, how do you measure that? Well, the, uh, most of the time it's used the uh, modified Mercalli intensity scale. That's the 1 to 10, and I have a, uh, a slide here in just a second that shows that. 10, we definitely don't want to see. We don't want to see 9. 
you know, the two, maybe some people feel it, maybe they don't. That's high enough. <laughs> so where is the Cascadia subduction zone? Uh, for those who don't have any idea, it actually sits from Vancouver Island off the coast, about 70 to 100 miles, and runs from the northern part, uh, or Vancouver Island, all the way down to northern California. And it's comprised of three plates uh, that all sit there, uh, the Explorer, the Juan de Fuca, and the Gorda Plate. And they all represent the uh, uh, Cascadia subduction zone, where one plate or one, this particular plate series is pushing under another one. And I'm not going to steal any of Dante's <laughs> thunder. But as they do push underneath, they get stuck. And uh, if that's where the problem comes in, they're stuck. And just like a spring getting tension, I kind of used a spatula at one time to give an example where you just kind of push the spatula underneath one side and when it releases all of a sudden it flings up. That's kind of what we are going to see if this were to uh, go along the entire uh, subduction zone. Uh, this is that scale, that intensity scale that I mentioned to you. And obviously, uh, as you go through some slides, you will see some of those yellows on there and approaching close to the, uh, the rust colored. So uh, with that said, I'm going to turn the presentation over now to Dante. Uh, Dante is from the Washington State Emergency Management Division. He's worked the tsunami issues on the inland side. And uh, thank you, Dante, for being here today. All right, everyone. Uh, my name is Dante Sabatino. I work for Washington State Emergency Management Division. Um, I'm one of two tsunami program coordinators, work on a team, um, the geohazards and outreach team. And our job is to really connect, uh, you know, supporting local jurisdictions, but also getting the word out and sharing, you know, information uh, so you can be able to make the decisions and bring that back and start asking those difficult questions uh, with your businesses and the like. Um, I'll kind of expand. That was a really perfect introduction talking about the Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, Washington State has the second highest earthquake risk in the United States. There's a couple different kinds of earthquakes that we can experience here. Um, how many of us have ever experienced an earthquake before? All right. Well, some of the next couple of slides are going to be pretty, <laughs> you know, they're going to seem, you know, pretty, uh, you know, pretty familiar then I'd say. Um, how many of us have experienced the, or, or felt the shaking in 2001 uh, during the squally here in Washington? All right, just a, a few less. Um, so that was the last major earthquake that our uh, state experienced. Um, but there's a couple different kinds of earthquakes we can experience here in Washington. Primarily, we're talking about the Cascadia subduction zone, or uh, otherwise known as the big one um, that people talk about when you first come to the Pacific Northwest. Um, and these are very large earthquakes. Um, these uh, subduction zone earthquakes produce the largest earthquakes in the world to the likes of what we've seen in Japan in 2011, in Indonesia in 2004, um, and of course along Alaska. Um, we have subduction zone earthquakes, what we saw in 1964 there. They also can produce the uh, world's uh, largest uh, tsunamis as well. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Um, and just like Wally was saying, um, and I have a good slide that shows that, but what we see with the Cascadia subduction zone is we see one big tectonic plate going underneath another, and then it, tension builds, and it breaks, and that's causing quite a bit of damage. Um, now, Nisqually, uh, from the very, if you look on the graph here where it shows deep earthquakes, uh, Nisqually was one of those deep earthquakes. Um, and also we can have some crustal faults. So I know um, some folks here today are going to talk more about some of those crustal um, uh, faults in the area, but uh, can experience quite a bit. For those that have experienced earthquakes in here, what can you expect, right? Well, ultimately, um, you know, they strike suddenly. You can't predict them. Um, lights are flickering off and on. You can't really predict the movement on the ground. Windows can shatter. You know, we've, we've seen this um, for a lot of the folks in the room here of what you can um, expect, which ultimately has pretty uh, drastic consequences on the infrastructure around us that we're relying on. Uh, sorry, the one image here is not the clearest, um, but this is a, uh, just to kind of give you a glimpse, this is a shake map. Um, so shake maps give us an idea of what is the intensity of that shaking going to be looking like. Um, so obviously the darker the reds, the more intense the shaking, and as it gets the cooler, it's less shaking. Um, but what we see is that, especially in this area here in western Washington, that we're experiencing between somewhere between strong and severe. Uh, shaking. Uh, what does strong 
and severe shaking mean? Well, looking at that uh, scale that we talked about, that can be, you know, just looking at the three, reading them for that strong shaking felt by all, you know, many people are frightened, some heavy furniture is moved, some fallen plaster, um, some damage is, you know, slight. But then when you go up on that, you start to see this is where our infrastructure starts to get pretty impacted. Um, you know, you have damage, um, start to see some uh, damage in, you know, poorly built or badly designed structures. I'm going to throw in our unreinforced masonry buildings in here, our brick buildings that we have thousands of in this state, by the way. Um, you know, and ultimately when we get to that higher end, the, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we see a lot, uh, a lot more considerable damage in our buildings. But what's important to say is that this is all modeling. And this is what we're trying to model for what the expected impacts could be. Um, oh, yes. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say, um, not, not digging in the, I'm trying to dig in the back pocket here. The last uh, major Cascadia subduction zone quake that we had was near 1700. Um, now, I'm not sure what the, off the top of my head, what that magnitude might be. But that's something maybe afterwards we can talk about, or maybe one of the other presenters here might be able to have that answer more specifically. Uh, yeah, there was another question. 6.8 in 1900. Um, so I will say with the Cascadia subduction zone, the last major rupture being in 1700, I would expect that probably the shaking would be a little bit higher, at least a little bit more felt, you know. But it, it depends on where, it's, it's a good question though, it depends on where your location might be. Oh, yeah. Um, that would be that 1700 quake. So we'll circle back to this. This is a really great question, and we'll see. Because um, that's the, the last major earthquake our state would have, on that scale, from a Cascadia subduction one, uh, would have been in uh, the January of 1700, which caused a distant tsunami in Japan, which we know that because it was actually picked up in a lot of stories and stuff in Japan in that year. But uh, we'll circle back to that, too. Oh, yes. All different directions. Yeah, all different directions. But that's a great question. Um, Dr., you may have to repeat the question for people uh, just for the third one. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I had a couple of questions coming in for those uh, listening in. A couple of questions was the largest, uh, the last largest quake um, that uh, we experienced here in Washington, which most likely was that uh, 1700 uh, last Cascadia subduction zone rupture. Um, and also another question that came in was these shaking. Which direction could you see, expect? Is it side to side, up and down? It's pretty much all different directions. And I'll show you what, on this next slide here, what can that look like, right? So here's just some, you know, images from around the world, right? We see some pretty drastic, um, you know, landslides and uh, damage to railway infrastructure, um, bridges. I won't go into too much detail because then we have some fantastic presenters that will go into more detail of what that can look like here. But really, the critical infrastructure that we are relying on getting in between those places and in the places that we work and we live could be... Uh, really destabilized. Um, the shaking itself um, causes quite a bit of secondary hazards, too. Um, one, you know, we I already alluded to this, tsunamis. Um, <laughs> it makes up my whole job. Um, but, you know, you know, tsunamis can be triggered, um, you know, by the movement of the seafloor, and I'll show what that kind of looks like on the next slide. Uh, landslides, which they, too, can trigger tsunamis. So if you look around here, looking out in the bay, you can see those slopes. Um, Fires, damaging to infrastructure, liquefaction, and something that people don't talk about too much, it's not just that initial quake, but aftershocks can be felt sometimes for these large, large uh, earthquakes can be felt for many, many years to come. And sometimes those aftershocks can actually be a little bit larger uh, than the first one. So we're not just talking the one thing. Uh, we're talking cascading multiple secondary hazards that can be happening. Um, and liquefaction is one of them. So when we think about the stabilization of the roads themselves um, and, you know, the tarmacs um, that we're relying on uh, for air airports and thinking about our port infrastructure, liquefaction is where the soil literally does liquefy. If you've ever been to the beach and, and on... Um, if you've ever been to the beach um, and tap your hand on the sand a couple of times, you see the water and you see kind of how it, it literally liquefies. That's kind of what we're 
seeing. And I know there's some presenters that will talk a little bit more specifically about how that can manifest. But ultimately, you see even here at the top right, I'm not sure which earthquake this was, but this is from Mexico. These are entire apartment buildings that sunk into the land. Um, and that can uh, happen. And uh, we're learning a lot more about that. Um, you know, talking about the aftershocks may be more hazardous than the first. Here's uh, some images. I believe these are uh, from New Zealand, maybe. I gotta, gotta get that fact right. But ultimately, you see in the top part of this picture, you see some, uh, you know, buildings that made it through that first, uh, first main earthquake. But then in subsequent aftershocks, uh, even little, even less, right? Um, it caused a lot of the, that infrastructure in those buildings to be damaged. Um, there's a lot of damage and things that we don't see, which this is a theme to think about, is that sometimes when we're looking at our critical infrastructure, our ports, our roads, airports, there is a lot that needs to be done to, to see what the integrity is of those, to be able to use them. So even though some things might not be visual to the naked eye, that they'll be good to go. Um, uh, there's a lot of evaluation that would need to happen. Dante, this is Dan Banks. Oh. I can confirm those those uh, pictures you just showed were from Christ versus New Zealand. Perfect. That's what I thought. Thank you so much, Dan. And um, I see a question. Yeah. Yeah. So, what is the date for the aftershock of five months? And I know that some other people are giving aftershocks in the same two days or weeks, maybe. So, how long is the aftershock rest period after a major earthquake? Great point. Um, the larger the uh, the quake, so like a Cascadia subduction zone. Um, and anyone online or out here can add to this if you'd like, but it can be um, for tens of years, um, potentially even longer. I mean, this is a lot of moving tectonic plates. It's not just a quick slip. There's a lot of adjusting where uh, the Cascadia subduction zone itself is over 700 miles long. And not, while not all of it might be rupturing at the same time, um, you can see even in this image just how much energy that is. And this actually shows perfect of how that works. And it is under the ocean, which then causes the displacement of that water, which causes tsunamis. Now, in this image, you can see why is Japan getting a tsunami from us, <laughs> and you know, or we're getting a tsunami from them? Well, that's where that local and distant uh, tsunami comes in. So, if we, um, you know, in 2011, uh, Japan had uh, had a major cascade, uh, not a cascade, a major subduction zone earthquake. Um, we had a distant tsunami on the other side of the world because it propagates over the entire uh, Pacific Ocean. Um, so, there's the local tsunamis. But I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, yes, yeah, question. That's correct. The approximate span, does it go up into Canada? So, yeah, so, um, and I think we had a good image earlier, but it's basically northern California into southern uh, British Columbia is where we're talking. So it doesn't have to have a passport across the border? <laughs> <laughs> no, which you're bringing up a very good point. So thinking about these kind of critical questions, especially where we're located here in Whatcom County, um, you know, uh, disasters don't care. <laughs> And uh, but then you but then you still have to go over these international borders right. and lines and, and our flood last year yes was very devastating in BC as it was here exactly and you saw some of the setbacks that an international border could ha ha have with that and even I'm taking a lot of lessons learned and learning you know at, you know from where I'm at because this is going to be not only a you know crossing states uh, kind of disaster to think about. Um, but this is an international one, and the tsunamis will impact more parts of the world and our coastline. So tsunamis are caused by a displacement of water. There needs to be a displacement of water, whether that's you know, from the subduction zone, which we're talking about here. You can see that energy is pushed up. It's just kind of released, and it has to go somewhere, and that's what causes uh, tsunamis. Uh, well, some of them. They can be caused by a lot of different things, but we'll focus on the Cascadia subduction zone talk and maybe not a meteor impact today. <laughs> um, they, um, there's a misconception that tsunamis, it's just the one. Uh, that's not true. Um, they, it's just multiple waves uh, lasting 12 to 24 more hours. I'm going to show some graphics that kind of show that, but it's like ripples in a pond. The water and the energy is going to be dissipating and moving around. Um, and also that first wave might not be the highest or most destructive. They're very fast moving. This bottom image really shows a difference between wind waves and also looking how tsunamis move. Tsunamis move uh, like a wall of water. 
they're moving they're moving straight forward um, versus the energy being dispersed in a wind wave. Um, now we know um, you know for Cascadia subduction zone, I'll give you some statistics. For the, within the next fifty years, the Cascadia subduction zone could rupture. Uh, between there's a 15 to 25 percent chance. The numbers range a little bit higher and lower, but it's we're, you know it's uh, 15 to 25 percent chance that we could expect a large Cascadia subduction zone rupture. And what we model for and we talk about is that maximum considered scenario. So for planners and businesses, um, we can plan to that maximum considered scenario and ultimately. Um, be able to start asking, you know, answering those difficult questions, doing things like the Cascadia Rising exercise so we can learn more. Um, we, we've, this is only a couple of decades of learning about the Cascadia subduction zone. Um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was in the 1980s we discovered the Cascadia subduction zone was a thing. Um, but um, I'll keep going so I don't take too much time here. Um, like I mentioned, you can have local tsunamis. So that would be like um, tsunami, you know, uh, if there's a uh, rupture in an earthquake like the Cascadia subduction zone, um, you know, or even some of the local faults uh, that we see, um, you will feel, feel the earthquake for a uh, local tsunami and shaking is going to be that primary warning. Um, ultimately, like I mentioned, that's what we're really talking about here today. But one thing I want to impress on folks that are in the room is that distant tsunamis from even Alaska, from Japan, can impact um, our state. And we're learning a lot more about what that could look like. So being on the inner coast here and where we are in Whatcom, um, for a distant tsunami, not as much of a threat. It's more of an outer coast thing. But it is important to think about how that will impact potentially a uh, supply chain, you know, and thinking about, you know, we, yeah, you might be at the receiving point here, but on our outer coast, if you're relying on certain aspects of our outer coast uh, for receiving goods and services, uh, that can be um, impacting you all as well. Great question. Um, so the question was, what is SFZ? Um, SFZ. Um, so CSZ is the Cascadia subduction zone, an example of a local, um, you know, tsunami. And this is a slide I probably would have updated, is the Seattle Fault. There are actually a lot more local crustal faults in this area. And I know we have some folks that are going to probably talk a little bit more about that. Um, we don't know a lot about these crustal faults. We keep learning and discovering more. But these are ones that could also displace water. Um, and it can be nearby. Um, for Washington Geological Survey, there's been a lot of modeling for our Cascadia subduction zone and recently for the Seattle Fault. But given all of the geography in between here and Seattle, there's a lot of dissipation of that energy. So probably wouldn't be actually, I'd probably put an X <laughs> on Seattle Fault there. We're, we'd probably be um, you know, talking more about CSE. But that's a great question. And thanks for catching that. <laughs> Um, now I'm going to show a uh, simulation. It should automatically start. If it doesn't, oh, it does. Okay. So this is at the state at large. So wherever you're seeing the reds, that's a wave peak. Uh, wherever you're seeing the blues, that's a wave trough. So that's receding water or lower water than that mean high water. Um, and on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, we can see, this is for a tsunami, we can see time elapsed. So keep that in mind and think of where you are and what you're relying on uh, might be. This is a uh, modeled Cascadia subduction zone, uh, you know, uh, tsunami for what can be expected. Washington Geological Survey makes these wonderful um, simulations that are available online anytime. And I'll be sure to show some more specific ones in this area on the next slide. So if you take a look, within uh, 10 to 15 minutes, or about that window, the outer coast is getting those 10 feet or higher uh, waves. But coming in about that 45 minutes, you see the wave propagating. The first thing you see in this area is receding water, which is that blue. And as it wraps around and goes to the north and the south, um, those are the first things that we start to see. So we're really about two hours or so in is what this area can uh, anticipate that, um, that wave coming in. Now notice this, the continued time elapsed. Um, you can see the waves continuing, uh, that 12 to 24 more hours. Now we're three hours in right now, three and a half, and you see ripples bouncing in between the lands because we just have a lot of energy being dispersed throughout um, 
you know, the Strait of Juan de Fuca in Puget Sound. But what I really like about this image is it really does show us, hey, this is not just a one-time thing. First wave might not be the largest, but it does give us an idea of what a potential wave arrival time, this is all modeling, and what you can do with that. What this does not show is that the shaking could cause landslides too. Shaking could cause landslides right out here, and then that can cause a tsunami too. But the drawdown is something that a lot of folks don't talk about, and that's where the bay in the water pools out, your boats get grounded, and that can happen much sooner than the actual tsunami wave coming too. So here's some more specifics looking right in Bellingham. Um, and like I mentioned, on their YouTube page, um, Washington Geological Survey has these available. So, and um, I'll make my slides available uh, too. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and press play on this. So this again is, you know, that a little bit more of a zoomed in look uh, for wave arrival. The bottom right has it now. Um, again, about 45 minutes or so, but look at that blue. That's what we're gonna focus on first is that initial trough. So the water starts to be receding in this area about an hour and a half or so, a little bit less. Um, and that's gonna be your first natural warning sign, right? Um, now that's gonna be, and then you can see the inundation that's expected in the port of Bellingham area here. Um, and that, that's fairly significant. Uh, it's fairly significant. Um, and uh, uh, yes. That's a great question. I'm gonna pick on some folks that are here in the room that have more site-specific <laughs> knowledge on that. The question was, is how far inland would we expect uh, 10 feet of water or so uh, to go? And it depends on where you are. Um, uh, I don't know if someone else wants to add in on that. We can, we'll hold that question and I'll be able to share it because there are inundation maps where you can get more of that information. What I will share is that this, this trough is not just 10 feet, it's 10 feet or higher. Um, but um, there are some good inundation maps that show that information. What I will share on the next slide here is one that's gonna really drive a conversation around how our waterways are going to be changing a little, you know, that how they could change. This is the same graphic, but this is current speed. The deeper the blue, the purples, the higher the current speed. Purple is nine knots or higher. So the, all that energy is moving through in this area. You can start to see some of the changes um, you know, as time's coming in. With the first wave arriving, you can see heavy current speeds coming through. And this is what's gonna be changing and moving around all of that sediment. Um, you know, the, the boats, the infrastructure. Um, this is where that's really important to keep in mind. And it does continue. Yes. Yes. Uh, I don't remember the year, I'm sorry. 2011. Thank you. 2011. How high was that wave? When you talk about a wave hitting us that's 10 feet or higher, do you know the height of what that wave was? So I don't have the exact um, wave height on, for Japan in the top of my head, okay. but I definitely know someone in this room does. <laughs> um, but when we talk, yeah. And when we, yeah, and the question was, is just how high was, were those waves in Japan? Um, and here's some images that show that, but I see a hand in the back. Yes. And that's a great question. Um, and that leads perfectly into these next couple of slides. So here's some pictures from Japan in 2011 showing what that wave looks like. Remember, it's a wall of water, right? Um, and this, now remember, this is our outer coast, right? This is what, you know, is primarily outer coast. It, the wave and the energy does dissipate as it comes in. But just like we don't, you know, we're sharing the international border with Canada and we're sharing these, <clears throat> you know, other borders, um, 
you know, it, we, we our infrastructure and the way, and you all know much more than I do about for those in the room, depending on where businesses and things are coming from, but it is a whole system. It's not just isolated one area. Um, you can see this is a before and after for Outer Coast for Japan. So especially if one of your points of distribution or things you're relying on are connected to the Outer Coast, um, it can be fairly devastating. I see a question in the back. So one thing that Japan has that we don't have and we're still integrating is the built-in, that culture of preparedness and sharing for generations of storytelling. Um, and even there was documentation in 1700 of the waves that they experienced there. Um, you know, I know um, I've heard, I have a lot more to learn specifically about Japan's uh, alerting system, but um, folks know what to do and what to expect, and that's why part of my job, the funding I'm doing, going out in the communities, is to continue sharing this, because we are, we're just not practiced as much in our state. Um, and we have, as far as one of the roles that I have on our team, we meet with the National Tsunami Warning Center and National Weather Service to continue improving and plugging the holes in our alerting as a state, but I'm happy to talk more about that afterwards as well. Um, I'll be, I want to make sure I'm okay on time. I'll probably want to wrap up, right? Yeah. Soon. Let me wrap up very soon here. So significant impacts uh, in Japan. Um, you know, for infrastructure, I'll let folks afterwards talk about that what that looks like for our vessels itself, drag on large vessels, debris in the water, um, scour and sedimentation. Um, you know, these are just some images from Japan of what that, you know, what that looked like. I mean, this is pretty devastating. This is why some of these ports and uh, harbors did not, um, did not open back up. Um, but what we're seeing here, right, is what we're expecting, damaged fuel pipe systems and pumps, bridges, overpasses, roadways, um, port and marina infrastructure. In Japan, over 2,000 roads, 56 bridges were damaged in 2011, and 28,000 ships and 319 ports were destroyed. So that's a lot of information in a short amount of time, but the takeaway on this information is to see what does these things look like, to get a little bit more educated, to learn about your hazards, and then take that back and say, okay, how is that going to impact the work that I do and how I'm going to protect myself, employees, and things like that? There is a lot more people that are going to be talking after me, <laughs> so I apologize for going a little bit over on that one. Um, but I appreciate the questions, and I know there will be – I'll be here, and there will be others talking. I'm looking forward to seeing more site-specific stuff here in Wacom. Um, other than that um, – I will pass it off to Dan. Dan, I know you're joining us online. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Give me a second. I'm trying to take control, but it won't let me. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So as Wally said, I'm Dan Banks. Uh, I've been working for WASDOT for about uh, a little over four years, but I've been doing state-level emergency management uh, with Department of Health and Emergency Management Division for uh, 20 years. So a little experience in this area. Uh, been doing uh, doing a lot of planning, and so we'll go on. So I'm going to kind of focus on, uh, you know, how Cascadia will affect the state infra state highway infrastructure in Whatcom County. And I have to caution you. I am I'm WASDOT. We are concerned with our state highways. We are the lead for transportation for the state, but we really focus on the state highways. And I don't have that much on the on your county or city roads. What can we expect in Whatcom County? Okay, we you know the road surfaces. Uh, if you know if the shakings as predicted, we're definitely going to have impacts, particularly in those areas that are subject to liquefaction. And you have a lot of alluvial soils in Whatcom County, and they will have that type of impact. This is an area, actually, uh, the picture you see here is actually in Thurston County, not far from where I live. And this is an area probably about uh, 300 feet in elevation uh, above the above sea level, but it's a swampy area with a road running across it. Also, you're going to have impacts from the tsunami in Whatcom County, particularly uh, SR 543 up in the Blaine area. It runs in some very low-lying uh, areas that will probably, even with a only uh, a six-foot uh, rise in water level, will uh, 
over uh, overflow onto the roadway. Now, the biggest weak link in our infrastructure uh, for transportation across the state is bridges. Uh, just in the in the shaking impact zone in Washington State, there's probably around 3,000 bridges. So there's a lot of bridges. So shaking will have its impacts. Uh, if you the link down at the uh, bottom, and I'm going to show a slide that shows this shortly, but that link takes you to what's called the RRAP, a Regional Resilience Assessment Program study, and it shows one study's uh, look at possible impacts from Cascadia uh, from a Cascadia incident in uh, Washington State. It, it's it's kind of disheartening, but it's a good planning tool to look at this. The other, uh, we will have tsunami impacts to bridges, uh, particularly Scour in Whatcom County. Uh, once again, mostly on 543. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, though, uh, SR11 uh, Chuckanut Drive. At least in the Whatcom County portions, we don't expect any tsunami impacts, but we definitely expect impacts from the shaking, landslides. Uh, other, you know, ground deformation, those type of things. As you guys well know, you know, this is a regular uh, regular thing that happens on uh, checking that drive. And it, particularly if it's in the winter time, those soils are saturated, we could even see more impacts along checking it. Okay. <clears throat> One of the things the RRAP study did that's really good is it, uh, it they took into account how long based on the expected damage it would take to repair the bridges so if you look at the what if you look at the uh the maps in this you could actually click on every little dot it'll tell you this most of them were less than 100 days that's good but there are some major impacts um that will be uh longer than 100 days uh some of them i just pulled out and there's probably more is i5 across the nooksack river those are uh, liquefiable soils and plus it's a bridge crossing water at a minimum it's going to take 243 days to repair sr 543 at nugent's corner that's right about where it meets up with sr 9 548 days sr 9 at uh, north fork of the nooksack just south of deming there 913 days and i want to caution you remember this is one bridge you have all the resources you need to repair that bridge if you're talking multiple bridges, resources are going to be distributed. And uh, we've got the entire state to uh, deal with. One of the things I want to point out, uh, Wally's background, it shows the Skagit River Bridge. WASDOT is still patting itself on the back for repairing that bridge in about uh, just over 40 days. You know, and that was in a non-threatening environment. Uh, we had all the resources we could. In just one bridge, we were able to concentrate and do it in 40 some days you know uh there's going to be some major impacts like we're uh 405 and um and i-90 meet that area uh down in king county is a major uh will have major impacts because of the soils there you know all trying to do this i'm going to show some more here so here's the rrap bridge assessment and it shows you the, the red dots are the worst case. There's some orange dots. They're hard to kind of see. There's just a few. Those are medium. And the yellow dots are, uh, you know, limited uh, damage. And if they're not, if they're not a dot, uh, they're probably no damage. But, okay, and this is just based on the RRAP assessment. But you can see Whatcom County, although not as bad as some counties, uh, if you go look at the larger map, uh, still has some significant areas of red dots. You'll particularly look along the Nooksack uh, and up in the Sumas area. Those areas will be uh, directly affected. You can see even farther south, down around uh, Mount Vernon and Burlington, those areas are going to be affected. So, so damage expected, Whatcom County, uh, other areas. Um, we are the lead for transportation, but I'm just going to touch on these and let these folks talk to it. But Bellingham International, what I've looked at, low risk of liquefaction, but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be impacts to the runway. They'll talk more later. There, uh, the good news is no tsunami threat. It sits at about 150 feet elevation and far enough in, inland. Float Haven, that's a seaplane uh, landing area just off of Fairhaven. Uh, that, you know, that should be in good shape, except 
you got all this tsunami debris. The other thing is, uh, seaplanes have a very limited capacity to carry things. So Point Roberts Airport for uh, Point Roberts, that actually sits very close to the water uh, at a fairly low elevation. It'll probably not be usable. Those folks are gonna have to look north in the Sawasin and uh, you know the Southern mainland of British Columbia. The Alaska Ferry Terminal, it's not a Washington state asset. You could echo this for the Lumi Ferry too. Uh, and so we really haven't looked at that in as how we um, how it would uh, fare in a response. Okay, response. Okay, WASDOT is putting a lot of work into response and and partnering with our local uh, local uh, road partners. Uh, we have uh, we've uh, developing the capability to uh, all our maintenance uh, personnel to go out and do road inspections. You know, drive these routes. They're they're developing routes and the look at both roads and bridges, okay? Once again, uh, bridges, the weak link that I talked about earlier. Uh, so we we have developed the capability of, of most of our, uh, our maintenance uh, personnel to do what we call level one inspections. And this is kind of a, a cursory inspection. You go out, bridge looks good, you're looking for major cracks. It's about a four hour training session that we do. And we have invited uh, local partners to participate in that. And really what we're doing is saying, go out, look at the bridge. Would you let your family drive across this bridge? And if not, then it needs what's called a level two inspection. And that's a specialized inspection. We only have 32 crews in WASDOT that are capable of doing these level two inspections. They also re generally require specialized equipment. Uh, one of the uh, usual things is a, called a U-bit truck. That's a truck that you can actually uh, get in the cherry picker, go over the side of a bridge and come up underneath the truck and look at the bridge. There's only, I think, nine of these in the state. WASDOT owns eight, and I believe the city of Seattle owns one. So getting that. So we're going to need a lot of help just to do inspections from outside the state. Airport inspections. We're going to really depend on local staff to do that. WASDOT has some very limited cap uh, capability to do that. And, uh, and then we're also gonna need federal support. The feds will probably not uh, let their aircraft uh, land and take off from runways until they've sent in inspection teams to look at that. So, okay. Washington State Ferries, okay. So, one of the things you're gonna you're gonna find is everybody who's got a shoreline will think that they can get a ferry uh, to solve their issues uh, after a major incident like this. But we only got 21 ferries. Uh, those fer of those 21, there's usually at least one in maintenance uh, if we're lucky. And as you've seen in the news, quite often that's more often. Uh, and also we're dependent on crew availability. Uh, trying to get those crews because they live all over the uh, Western Washington and trying to get them there to work is not going to be easy. The other thing to remember is ferries require specialized docking. I'm not sure if the Lumi Island Ferry or the Alaska Ferry uh, terminals in Whatcom County can accommodate our ferries. Uh, these, th you know, these are very specialized and they're not exactly the same type. They cannot load with any significant capability over the side. So pulling a ferry up to uh, you know, a slip and uh, loading stuff over the slide, not a, a realistic way of approaching this. Also, use of ferries is gonna be prioritized by the governor through the state EOC. So if you think you need a ferry, you've gotta work through the EOC process. So that needs to go from the Whatcom County EOC to the state EOC, and then that will be vetted uh, through the uh, governor's working group, uh, the policy room on whether or not, on where those resources are going to go. Restoring the system. So currently WASDOT has identified what's called the seismic lifeline. This basically runs from Payne Field to McCord uh, in the central Puget Sound area. Uh, and it 
it goes uh, I-5 to 405 and around back uh, to I-5 again. It skips Seattle because the Ship Canal Bridge and several other bridges in uh, the Seattle area, we do not expect to survive, okay? We're also gonna prioritize, uh, you know, border to border, reopening routes to uh, British Columbia. It's been mentioned several times, but one of the things is, is particularly during the winter time, British Columbia, the Southern mainland of British Columbia, where most of the population is, their main routes over uh, by truck uh, are through Washington state. Uh, they do not have a four lane highway that uh, connects with the rest of uh, Canada. So we were, we were aware of that and we will work closely with those things. The state has established its priority routes. We're working with our, uh, with our, our staff make sure they know that i mean uh and these are based on you know how many cars or how many vehicles normally use that route every day we've worked working uh to uh, map out the local priority routes i've been working with john gargett and some of your folks on doing that we've had several conversations on that restoring the system will be determined by need and for us at the state level the governor is our boss so the governor's office is where we expect that direction to come from. It will work through the state EOC. So as the local um, jurisdictions determine they, their need, feed that up through the EOC system, it feeds into the state EOC where they'll prepare the information uh, to go to the governor's office to make those decisions. So the county needs to know what they need access to. They need to know where their hospitals, food, water, shelter, and any of those other major things are and how they will request access to that and how that will be impacted by the state highway system, local highways, all those type of things. So I just wanted to mention, there are several studies out there. I've talked about the Regional Resilience Assessment Program that was completed, I think it was uh, two, early 2019. Uh, it's kind of a doom and gloom uh, study, but it has a lot of good information and it's good for planning. There's two studies that have come out in the last week or so. Uh, I'm not even gonna read the titles, but they're up there. I've read both those studies and I'll have to say, I'm not an engineer and I don't understand what they've said. I do have an appointment with our bridge engineers uh, in about a week uh, to sit down and talk through those studies and get a better understanding. But at least my preliminary look at those studies is they tend to say, hey, things are not as bad as the RRAP study, but they also don't look at things like liquefaction or the impacts on columns. So questionable of how useful those studies are as a planning tool. And finally, this I want to talk about some other ongoing activities. OK, the seismic lifeline, you know, it's limited. But we're actually discussing um, about expanding it, and I apologize. It also runs basically from four uh, on I-90 from 405 to Moses Lake right now. We're gonna we're looking at expanding it on I-5 border to border, and then I-90 from uh, uh, basically from the Idaho border to Bellevue. Okay, uh, there's a bit a lot of work, and I know you've heard about it about retrofit, uh, but realize the retrofit activities we, we can do are really from the surface up. So they don't deal with things like look of faction or uh, the structure that's underground. The, the real gist of what we're trying to do with retrofitting is make the bridge survivable that, so that it's not falling on people or, or collapsing and the people on the bridge are, uh, are injured but it doesn't mean that it's gonna be usable uh, after an incident. We are now though really looking at uh, for new construction, uh, how to do new construction. The um, current standard is life safety. It's a, you know basically similar to the retrofit. It survives so it doesn't kill people, but upgraded to a standard where it's called the recovery standard, where it's usable after an incident. The problem is, is every time we build a bridge, this adds 10 to 40%, depending on the bridge and where it sits, to the cost. But we're really uh, moving in that uh, direction. Recently, we had a bridge 
uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and the decision was made to build that to the recovery standard. It's the the bridge is uh, at I-5 in Woodland, uh, down in uh, between Clark and uh, Cowlitz County, and that's an important connection. Uh, we we are I believe we are building the four, uh, what is it the 520 bridges uh, in the vicinity of the University of Washington to that standard, and also the uh, uh, the Alaskan Way Tunnel was built to that standard. With that, that's what I have to say. I turn it back to you, Wally. Okay, Dan, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, does anybody have a question for Dan before? I, he's going to be on at the end. We'll hopefully have a little time for questions at the end. Otherwise, we're just going to keep going so that we keep on time here and we can get all of our uh, uh, speakers in. That's okay. Uh, the next uh, person that's going to be up, I'm going to introduce uh, Andy Weiser. Uh, Andy is a geologist for the Whatcom County Planning and Development Services. Okay, Andy, it's all yours. Thanks, Wally. Hi. Um, yeah, so my role at the um, County Planning Department, I'm a state licensed geologist, and I review development proposals that come into the county for um, geologic hazards that have the potential to impact life safety or, you know, cause a, a hazard to that development. And then if we need to, we develop mitigation uh, to help protect that, that development. Well, we're looking at a debris flow here that occurred in 2009 during a rain and on snow uh, climatological event. Uh, it produced many, many debris flows in, in the South Fork Valley along Highway 9 and out on 542. And this particular debris flow uh, occurred near Marshall Hill Road, covered 542 at Marshall Hill Road, and closed down the highway for uh, quite a few hours while um, crews were cleaning the debris off of the highway there. So for the purpose of my talk, I think it's pretty convenient to divide the geology of Whatcom County into three distinct geologic domains. Along our southern border and um, out towards, our, towards the east of Whatcom County is what I would term the tectonic terrain. Um, these are rocks that have been faulted, folded, upthrust due to the same convergent forces that are um, driving the, you know, the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake that we're talking about today. Um, the Chuckanut Mountains are actually one of the only spots, actually it is the only spot where the Cascade Mountain Range reaches all the way to the Puget Sound. And all five of our land-based uh, transportation corridors have to navigate the Cascade Mountains. Um, the next domain would be most conveniently referred to as the glacial domain. And this is a set of heterogeneous sediments that were deposited uh, during the last ice age. Um, Whatcom County, being the northernmost county in Washington state, was located closest to the advan advancing and retreating glacial ice. Um, and uh, because of that, we have a, a very diverse package of, of glacial sediments here in the county. Um, the uplands of um, uh, around um, H Street and Blaine and uh, near the refineries in uh, Ferndale, those are uh, glacial moraine deposits uh, that were pushed and deposited by the, by the glacial ice. Um, the glacial ice actually overrode a lot of these sediments and the heavy weight of the ice compacted and consolidated a lot of those sediments and so they're relatively competent and geologically stable. That being said, um, the glacial ice also depressed the land surface and some of the sediments during the glacial period were deposited on the ocean floor. And so those sediments are more silt and clay and some of them have not been over consolidated uh, and they are somewhat susceptible to becoming destabilized in, in, during geologic shaking, seismic shaking. After the glaciers retreated, um, we started to see the modern landscape form, and um, we're calling this the post-glacial domain, or maybe more appropriately the fluvial domain. This is the de deposition um, based on fluvial processes and erosion um, in our river valleys, descending from Mount Baker um, all the way to Bellingham Bay, uh, the formation of a large delta uh, prograding into Bellingham Bay. Um, the Nooksack River also has a very low drainage divide where it um, crosses uh, with, past Everson and Nooksack. And uh, there's been times in the geologic past where the Nooksack River has flowed out north towards Canada. 
and there's also at times been a, a quite large lake that was formed in the area of Sumas. So there's very loose, unconsolidated se uh, fluvial sediments there, mainly silts and sands. We also have coastal erosional processes at play. So we have the spits of Sandy Point and Semiamu, um, and we have um, bay, set, bay muds and sediment and sands uh, in Birch Bay and in uh, Bellingham Bay. So what might we expect locally um, due to the seismic shaking of a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake? Well, the uh, USGS, United, United States Geological Survey, has the ability to produce what's called a shake map. And these are scenarios that um, model what the ground shaking will be like during different seismic scenarios. On the right, we have the magnitude, magnitude 9 um, Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. And you can see that the um, the intensity of the shaking would just be strong during that event for Whatcom County. We're somewhat benefited by the fact that we are 150 miles away from the epicenter of that seismic event, so the, the, the severity of the shaking is reduced. What is not reduced, though, is the potential duration of the seismic event. And so other, cast, other subduction zone earthquakes have seen uh, shaking that has lasted five minutes and longer. And that, that duration of, intent, of shaking can really impact the types of damage that we might see during a seismic event. I also wanted to point out um, another uh, shake map that the USGS produced for the Boulder Creek Fault. Uh, the Boulder Creek Fault is a crustal fault in Whatcom County. It exists um, pretty much, uh, runs from Kendall to Maple Falls along parallel, paralleling uh, Mount Baker Highway. Uh, it's postulated that it could have a magnitude 6.8 earthquake. Um, trenching across the fault has demonstrated that there's been three uh, magnitude six plus earthquakes in the last 9,000 years that have ha happened on this fault. And as you can see from the shake map, um, the localized shaking uh, around that uh, fault trace would be, um, would be violent. It comes in at the sphere to violent uh, magnitude. So um, impacts in that area could be quite severe. Um, it should, it's also worth noting that as you, as you get further away from the fault trace that the intensity of the shaking decreases quite rapidly, dis dissipates from the source. So uh, you could have uh, pretty, pretty different um, localized effects uh, based on these different types of seismic events. And I should note that um, for, the, for the shake maps that, that were produced for the 2017 FEMA risk map project for Whatcom County, um, they modeled uh, a few other faults. Uh, the, the Devil's, Devil's Mountain Fault uh, and uh, the Seattle Fault Zone Fault, and um, they all have um, shaking impacts in Whatcom County. A question in the back? The, the yellow area, what's the category for that? I think that's very strong. Yeah. Yeah. We service that area, and I'm thinking that's, that's swelling probably the least able to resist shaking. In that area? I, I would I would recommend referring to that 2017 FEMA risk report because um, they do a lot of um, structural analysis on um, the different seismic events and what kind of building survivability we might anticipate from those events. Mm -hmm. So what happens when the ground starts shaking like this? Um, the Department of Natural Resources, in conjunction with the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, has issued a couple of maps um, that are designed to help identify where seismic shaking would be the worst and what kind of impacts we might expect in those scenarios. So liquefaction is the process by which the pore pressure in a loose, unconsolidated, uh, sediment column really needs to be a fine sand, fine to, to medium grain sand. The pore pressure during that shaking starts to increase in pressure. The pressure increases to the point at which the pressure between the sand grains becomes greater. So the inner granular, inner granular pressure is exceeded by the pore pressure and the, sed and the sediment begins to turn into a liquid. Um, you might notice that this map looks very similar to our three distinct geologic domains. So um, this, the, the, really the shaking hazards associated with a, a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake are going to be focused around our fluvial deposits in Whatcom County. Uh, they also produce what's called an enhanced seismic shaking map. And so this is, um, this is referred to as site class. This is an engineering tool. Um, for identifying where additional uh, reinforcement is needed in, um, in building design. 
And you can also see that the fluvial sediments are um, more susceptible to this type of hazard. Uh, and the reason for this is because with the seismic waves traveling through the earth, they reach these loose sediments and they start to shake a little bit more. And so the ground shaking would be worse in these locations. So what happens when the ground starts? No oh, question, sorry. So that's the post yes. Yep, the post-glacial. Our, our, basically, our river valleys, our deltas, our, and the bays. Yep. Um, so when the ground starts shaking, we see this liquefaction um, and consolidation settlement. We get things like ground settlement. You know, after the ground shakes and liquefies, sometimes it it settles out denser than it was before, and so you get settlement in those areas. But in other places, you get uh, heave or sand boils and the ground can buckle. Uh, this can cause foundation failure, it can cause bridge approaches to become um, impassable, uh, road settlement and offset. My understanding from talking with the DOT is that many of the bridges are, um, and when Dan mentioned it, many of the bridges are retrofitted for the bridge to stay solid, but really to mitigate for liquefaction hazard, you have to extend your foundations through the liquefiable soils. Um, and most times, at least for historically constructed bridges, that just hasn't been completed. Um, we should also be worth noting that the amount of liquefaction settlement and damage is really directly correlative with how deep the soil profile is that is subject to liquefaction. So if you've got 150 feet of liquefiable sands beneath a structure, you can expect, you know, 10, 20, 30 inches of ground settlement um, after that liquefaction comes to a, comes to a stop. Um, we're also, so what I'm looking at, what I've got here for this slide is a, is a bathymetric map of Bellingham Bay. And so uh, you can see the Nooksack River prograding out into Bellingham Bay, the delta there. And the fore slope of the delta is depicted by those steep uh, contour lines that are extending to the south. Um, there's another process associated with liquefaction called lat termed lateral spreading. And this is when liquefaction occurs next to an open face on a slope. And if the soil liquefies and there's nothing to hold the, the soil from flowing towards that open face, you can get uh, a process where you get a, it's essentially a landslide on a very low gradient surface. And there's a pretty, um, pretty dramatic example of this from the Sulawesi. Uh, earthquake in uh, Indonesia in 2018 and I got a, a short video here showing what this can look like. This area was, um, and this, was this was lateral spreading on the order of a mile um, and it happened all, all throughout this area. Um, you can see entire villages moving laterally and the ground surface here is is three percent um, it's really it's really a very flat area. Um, it's kind of a, a wild story. The gentleman that took this video he, he actually survives, and he wrote he rode his house through the through the lateral spreading event, and I think his house was displaced like you know a thousand yards or something like this, maybe even more. So I don't know for certain if lateral spreading is a a potential in. Uh, Bellingham Bay, but I think we do have um, some of the characteristics here that could potentially produce this. And some some of those some of the road failure images that we saw earlier in the talk those were those were really lateral spreading. It was liquefaction near the edge of a body of water, and the and the slope gave out during that liquefaction, and that's what caused the road to to fail. All right, well, I'm going to move on now and talk a little bit more about rock slides. Um, this is the hazard that would be more impactful in our tectonic geologic domain. And again, all of our roads into Whatcom County have to pass through this area. Uh, the cartoon in the upper left kind of depicts what a rock slide in the Chuckanut Formation would look like. The Chuckanut um, Formation is a sedimentary rock unit, and it's composed of thin to moderately thickly bedded sands and silts. Um, they have um, the, they've been tilted and folded and upthrust, and some of the beds dip towards the open slope, or in the instance of this, uh, the photos here, uh, you can see the, the two gentlemen there. You can see the bedding is dipping down towards the, towards the slope where they're standing. Um, there was a rock slide here in, 
think this is 2016 during uh, and it was caused by a rain event um, most of the rock was deposited on the slope um, but you can see in that bottom right photo that there's a, a road and that's that's Lake Whatcom Boulevard down at the bottom of that slope and some of the rock actually did make it all the way to the to the road and uh, actually struck a house as well so this is the type of failure mechanism that we see along um, Chuckanut Drive and really there's a potential for almost all of the roads um, into Whatcom County to have this kind of hazard. Um, I would say that you know if the seismic event occurs during the middle of winter during a particularly wet event that these impacts could be much worse um, but the acceleration um, due to the seismic shaking is enough to destabilize some of these slopes. Um, so we don't just have Chuckanut formation rocks in Whatcom County. We've got Darrington Phyllite in the um, lower south southeastern corner of the county, and then we've got more um, metasedimentary, volcanic, and metamorphic rocks in the in the northeast portions of the county. Um, this particular slide depicts what's what's a landslide referred to as the uh, Darrington slide, and um, it uh, is located above the town of Acme, and it's what it's what is termed a deep-seated landslide. This means that the failure plane extends more than 10 feet below the ground surface. So a lot of these slides are um, dormant, or they're moving very slowly. Uh, the Darrington slide is is active. As you can see in the photos there. There's quite a large offset in the um, in the head scarp region, as well as down near the toe of the slope, where the um, stream is is cutting through the snout of the slide. Um, the thing that is unclear, and there is some research documenting that some of the larger deep-seated landslides in the county, they correlate well with historic or prehistoric, you know, geologically identified seismic Cascadia subduction zone earthquake events. So it is possible that during a magnitude nine earthquake, that some of these large landslides, deep-seated landslides, could be reactivated. Um, this particular slide doesn't. Um, deposit directly to the valley floor. Some of the other deep-seated slides in the county do. What is, a, what is a hazard about this particular slide is if it were to reactivate and, um, and, and move forward rapidly, it could completely shut off the Jones Creek Valley there. Uh, and then it creates what's called a, a, a debris flow, or sorry, a landslide debris dam. Behind that debris dam can be a large lake can form. And then that, that fails catastrophically resulting in a debris flow that then could travel down and impact the community of Acme. So Acme has uh, repetitive sequences of um, large debris flows uh, of over 100,000 cubic yards in volume. Okay, so um, this is a process that happens repetitively. It doesn't just happen with, with, with seismic events, it also happens climatically. Um, so um, this is something that you can't really predict, and after a large seismic event, there'll be a team of people on the ground looking at some of these locations to identify any problems. Um, and and what we'll you know, it's kind of a cascading, you know, tertiary style hazard associated with a seismic event. I did want to talk a little bit more about debris flows um, and alluvial fans because um, there's a lot of them in the county. And a lot of our development is constructed on alluvial fans because they are located above the floodplains frequently, and they're high and dry, and um, it's just a convenient place to build. The, uh, the Washington Geological Survey recently completed a, um, a landslide inventory for Whatcom County using newly available LIDAR imagery, bare earth imagery, which we're looking at here. It helps, it helps geologists easily identify landforms on the, on the, on the ground. Um, and I think there's over nearly 291 alluvial fans identified in the county. And I counted, and Highway 542 crosses 17 of them between Nugent's Corner and Glacier. So um, there's a lot, there'll be a lot of places to check um, if, there's a large, if there's a large Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. We've talked a lot about tsunami hazards already, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. Um, I will say that the, the modeled um, tsunami hazard that we're dealing with here is, is the magnitude 9 full rupture of the Cascadia, Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, it's what they call the L1 event, which is supposed to be a 2,500-year recurrence 
event, right? So it's this is for design of critical infrastructure. That's essentially what the goal of this modeling exercise was. Um, the 2,500 year recurrence event is a uh, an event that only has a 2% chance of occurrence in the next 50 years. Okay, so we don't really design, um, our seismic design standards don't really address this type of hazard. That So the, the purpose of that discussion is just to indicate that this is pretty much the worst case scenario in the tsunami hazard scenario. Um, the other thing we have going for us is we have an hour and a half or to two and a half hours of arrival time before that tsunami arrives. So um, there's time to prepare for that. That being said, you know, with multiple arrivals, um, you know, at the mouth of the Nooksack River, we could have 15 plus feet of inundation. The marine, marine, um, marine drive bridge there would probably have some problems. Um, high velocities and um, uh, yeah, it'd just be another tertiary, secondary tertiary hazard of a seismic event that we would need to be prepared for. Uh, finally, uh, Dante talked about this. The, um, there are the ability for uh, submarine landslides to trigger tsunamis. And this is the same uh, Sulawese uh, earthquake and they captured the development of these um, uh, submarine landslide triggered tsunamis um, on camera. In fact, a boat was out in the in the bay at the time, and you can see multiple um, slope failures into the water, creating waves. And this is actually pretty. I'll turn this up. You can well. actually hear the landslide. Suddenly, however, a massive crushing sound is heard. At this point, the there is a landslide of liquefied soil right next to the boat. This landslide instantly generates a massive tsunami wave, which sets in motion and passes very quickly under the ship towards the town of Palu. So this uh, this sequence of tsunami, uh, submarine landslides produced a eight meter high tsunami that impacted Palu at the top of that bay. Um, and I would point out, though, that this kind of um, topography is what produces very large tsunamis, right? It's all the ways that there were landslides all along the shores of this bay that were concentrated due to the, the shape of this bay, right? Bellingham bay, Bellingham bay has a little bit of this, and this is partly why the Nooksack River mouth sees such high elevations. In, of inundation during a tsunami, um, but this is a worst case scenario, so I don't think we necessarily have to worry about that. All right, so just in conclusion, um, talk about our three geologic domains again. Uh, the tectonic areas will experience rock slides and debris flows. Um, you might notice that SR9 uh, is actually kind of out in the middle of the valley. Well, that doesn't get it out of tr harm's way, right? That just puts it into the uh, post-glacial or alluvial hazard areas in my experience, liquefaction, excessive ground deformation, uh, those sorts of hazards. The glacial domain is actually probably our um, least likely to experience extreme damage. The airport is located on that. Um, lots of our cities are located in those areas. But there is the, the, op the potential for um, localized ground deformation, um, as well as some of those loose sediments that I discussed that were deposited on the ocean floor. There are soft, soft sequences of, of sediments in some of those glacial deposits that have the ability to experience landslides. And again, it could be the, the seismic shaking that actually triggers that landslide. Um, and then finally, the post-glacial areas. Uh, I think we went over those pretty good. So um, thanks for the time. If you have any questions? Thank you, Andy. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to speak on behalf of Public Works today. But before I do that, I'd like to share just a little something. Uh, there was an exercise of FEMA conducted, and uh, the FEMA director, one of the first things he did when he walked in, and of course, uh, he had all the people there, he said, 25 or 33 percent of you are no longer here. You know, something happened to you, you're on vacation, but you're not here. This is what we have left to respond with. And the same thing would happen if we had an earthquake of this magnitude here. We're not going to have a full complement of people to go out and do the inspections, and a lot of this is going to play out over a lot longer period of time. There may be places that don't get inspected for, for you know, weeks after the fact. 
And I think that's something to keep in member as we uh, keep in mind as we move into, you know, something like public works. Uh, we expect them to go out and inspect the local bridges and things like that, but they're going to be impacted just like the rest of us. Those first 72 hours, uh, just like all of us, we're going to be dealing with our families, trying to figure out what's happened, and then they're going to be able to start getting into the office or to go out and start doing what they need to. That's going to be my uh, the one sales pitch that I am going to give you today, preparedness, because it is very important that we don't just look at three days, which has always been the norm for the past who knows how many years. We have to start looking at, just like the FEMA director did, these people aren't going to be here, so we're left with this. We've got to get along with a lot longer period in our own preparedness. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, So from the, uh, the bridge program emergency inspection procedures, uh, the first thing that happens after there's an earthquake, they're going to piece together their teams. And uh, their teams are comprised of a state individual, a construction person, and they have a list of bridges that they're going to go out. Uh, they actually have six geographical zones, and they're going to use their equipment to go out into those areas, check the bridges out. As they drive to and from these locations, they will be doing their windshield surveys of roads and things like that, and they will report those back to say that they're good, they're not good. They also carry with them the ability to uh, either block off a bridge or say it's restricted or whatever the case may be there. So they carry all that with them in their truck, again, assuming that the truck is available and they can get there. Uh, once they get out uh, into the field and they're starting to do their inspections, they're going to be reporting that damage back by radio, probably, uh, to here in our emergency operations center. Uh, hopefully, you know, people will be able to get in and receive that information because we're going to have to start establishing where the priority roads are those arterial roads and those secondary roads, uh, obviously with our mass care, uh, things like that, hospitals, those are roads that are going to be needed to be opened as quickly as possible because injuries, especially when you're talking about an earthquake, once you get past four days, uh, actually even three days, you start seeing the ability of life-saving to go down very rapidly and very quickly. So getting people to the hospital is going to be very important. Uh, and so... Uh, like I said, I'm going to be very quickly with the public works because I want to get in now to transition from what you can expect out of uh, Whatcom County to get out there, do that. But we want to talk about the, the other modes of transportation because that's the other thing that people look at. Well, if we don't have land, we'll just transition to one of the other ones to make up for the deficiency. And I'm going to ask Norm to come up first and speak to a little bit about the port and the things that they have to go through to get a port back open to accept cargo or passengers. As I mentioned, Norm is the emergency manager and safe and security officer for the Port of Bellingham. So, Norm? Thank you. Thank you, Wally. As uh, Wally stated, my name is uh, Norm Smith. I'm the emergency manager and security officer for the Port of Bellingham. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the decision processes to open the port back up. This is not going to be a deep dive into the incident command system, and this is not going to be a response-generated type of, of uh, presentation. It's going to be a pretty high-level stuff. And again, as Wally just beautifully stated, it's going to be delayed on getting resources in to do what we need to get done with this. And there's a lot of factors in place here with the... Uh, with this, this is an inter first thing transportation. Consider this an intermodal model, which is not only just water, but it, we rely also on roads and rail and the airport uh, as well, as well as ground transportation. So, one event that affects one affects all, and that all and that certainly lengthens that timeline out. And then, as we go through this, the only part of the incident command system I will touch on is. John will be working, and this office will be working with the state and the federal government as well because the Coast Guard will have a major say in the Marine side as to what occurs as far as uh, opening back up and also with shipping, which pays plays into our supply chain and resiliency. I'd like to recognize Don Goldberg in the room from our from the Port for Economic Development. He can uh, I'm sure he'd be willing to later talk to you about how that's all interconnected for commerce. But to say this is going to take time is an accurate statement. 
Uh, our, what our actions would be following a seismic event with the port initially, uh, as with everybody else, is getting resources to be able to do this. We can't really do anything safely to receive cargo or anything else after the drawdown has occurred. Remember, we're looking at, uh, Dante, what you talk about, 10 feet or more or more of water coming out. So when that all comes back in and it's safe to do so, we can start our inspections. Safe to say that uh, vessels tied up at Squalicum Harbor are probably going to be hitting the ground and then grounded and then back up and then docks will be damaged and how they're connected as well. So there's another part of this is going to be a, a pretty big environmental problem that has to be dealt with. So those inspections have to occur. The term wall use, windshield inspections, some of that will occur getting there, but a lot of it has to look at are the structures, you know, sound to receive cargo. We have an engineering department at the port that can do the initial, initial part of it, but with any of these things, especially with commercial transportation, um, the federal government's going to likely want to have their folks take a look at it, look at that for safety as well as getting that common operating picture. So we're going to look at docks, pilings, support attachments, and other. Those will have to be looked at to make sure that the uh, things can be uh, can be restored or, or put to an operational status to receive cargo with that. Utilities and communications, we're going to need to report that back out, what our findings are. That's going to be impacted. We've seen that time and time again with major events. Uh, with that one, so how are we going to communicate with that? How, what information? Who are we going to pass that, pass that through? Uh, we're going to be working with the city, as well as the county on this. And although we have the common 800 megahertz radio system, how is, is that going to be overwhelmed or not? We don't, we don't really know until minute one, day one occurs. And what information are we going to? Share I'm incident command systems ICS tells us what the minimum standards are our, our own emergency operations plan indicates uh, What information that we would share back, but there'll be other criteria that that uh, will need to be known once unified command is established and understand this is an incident of national significance and I don't want to understate that at all this is going to impact most of the West Coast so we're going to be one of many voices trying to communicate what is what is occurring, and uh, that's probably going to see a heavy federal presence at that point. Damage assessments, we're going to have to report that up to, up to uh, Unified Command, and likely there will be an area command established at some point because we've got the border as well. So resources have to get coordinated. Waterway, debris management, uh, that was mentioned many times today and that is a concern because uh, anticipate currents of 10 knots or better that's going to be taking all of the things that uh, people don't tie down or have been left in lowland areas and that's going to be deposited in the waterways which will then can create a traffic hazard for, ve for vessels and operations in general and also with that debris, is it contaminated? Likely, yes. You just don't go pick that stuff up. So there has to be a debris management plan to, to deal with that as well. And where do we put all of that? That's another aspect. A staging, like I said, next thing, staging areas. Where are those going to be stood up? While I already talked about that there are no landfills in this area in Whatcom County, that will have to be looked at. And some of this stuff has to be removed before you can bring barges or container ships in because uh, that's going to have to occur. Not to mention the um, our workforces, which are the ILUW for the port, they've got to make sure their people are safe. So these things are all going to stretch that timeline out pretty pretty severely. And unfortunately, one of the things we learned through a, another group called Penwar, who did a uh, who's done a lot of things on the resiliency side, uh, what they've determined and are working on with their partners such as the Coast Guard and other King County, et cetera, is that they've learned the hard way that many of the maritime sectors are, are not integrated into common emergency management plan. Dante shake his head because he gets to see these quite a bit, and they're not. Um, it's 
not until real recently that the epiphany occurred that, and as Wally said, trying to shift from one mode of transportation to another, uh, what that what that looks like in an emergency, and we found out we have a gap that we're trying to close. Uh, for the port, uh, port of Bellingham decision making, who who rests, uh, who rests with shutting the port down? Who has the authority? That's it's been delegated to the executive director Rob Fix. With that, uh, we will form our incident management team up, but that is that's initially until we this facility is up and running, and then we'll be transitioning uh, as part of this organization as well. Like I said, we're going to establish our incident command system, uh, start our, our initial damage assessment, and it's not just the shipping terminal or, or the cruise terminal, but it's also all port properties as well, and there's uh, quite a bit of it. We don't want to, although this is pretty centric on Bellingham Bay, we are going to have to look at, look at our facilities in Blaine as well. I'm sure uh, USGA has got new modeling they're rolling out for, for impacts to that area as well. So there's those aspects, the airport uh, as well, and then uh, anything, anything else that we're involved with. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of coordination up here uh, with Unified Command, and then, of course, the state's going to be involved as well because, again, this is an incident of national significance. I, and for, with that stating, um, there's a – before – we can do really any recommendations up. We have to review those damage assessments. Likely they're going to be more involved, as was talked about, uh, with the bridge program, uh, what's lying underneath, maybe a surprise nobody wants. So they'll be have to look at more technical or more in-depth inspections, especially with uh, a lot of the docks, the pier spaces, especially for commercial shipping. Uh, in the area here, some of those have been in play for quite a long time. That they've been needing of uh, some care and feeding over the years, and those have to be looked at. See how stable they are. And again, the Coast Guard is going to have to green light anything for shipping in the Puget Sound to occur. As we saw during uh, during 9/11, they'll put a hard deck um, hold shipping off. Besides, with an impact of this nature out in the big blue, uh, the ocean is uh, the ocean's got to settle down before we do anything else, anyway. So uh, those are kind of the factors. And my, my key point in this whole thing is that it's going to take longer than most people would envision it uh, taking to open the ports back up. It'll also require a lot of coordination on uh, not only from the federal level but the state level, local level. So it's going to be a it's going to be a consolidated effort. And then again, there's a not knowing what you don't know, and we won't know any. We won't have a good idea until we can actually get out, take a look, know what's occurred. I will say one thing: the discussion was brought up by Wasdot about the cruise terminal. Um, the cruise terminal can except the Watkins chief that very is it, that was done several years ago but as far as the Alaska marine ferry system goes on this one chances are um, they're going to have to make a determination based on their standards whether they're going to be able to operate or not and if they're in route likely they'll turn around and head back home or they can anchor out but it'll have there's another coordination piece that has to occur uh, with with that part of the intermodal transportation system. So with that, I am concluded my portion of this. If there's any questions, feel free to ask. And if you need to think of it later, Wally well, can give you my contact information. Thank you, Wally. Thank you, Norm. We're going to keep going right on. Uh, I'm going to bring up Alex Young now from the Bellingham International Airport. He's going to speak to us about the uh, uh, airport Bringing it back online. Thank you, Wally. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to keep this rather summary, as I believe our previous presenters have done a fantastic job of providing some critical information here. So thank you for doing the bulk of my job for me. Um, so 
The Seismic Resilience Project uh, in October 21 was a uh, study performed by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, based on the need from FEMA. And uh, Dan and Andy both uh, mentioned this, but uh, really the result of this um, study is that Bellingham International Airport is at low to moderate risk uh, with a blended risk rating of low for liquefaction. I'll just kind of keep it there. Um, Dan talked quite a bit about uh, bridges and roadways and the infrastructure. So what does this really mean for us? Um, any sort of damage is going to begin uh, with a series of special inspections um, of the airport infrastructure performed by my cadre and myself. We're going to be looking at pavement, lighting, navigational aids, other markings, um, our safety areas to ensure that anything in those safety areas is fixed by function. We are surrounded by wetlands and so there's some potential to have debris um, or other uh, things that are not fixed by function in those safety areas, so we have to ensure that those are clear. We must also ensure that uh, our aircraft rescue firefighting capabilities and functions are not adversely impacted. Uh, so we have a um, ARF bay with three aircraft rescue firefighting apparatus. If any of those are impacted, it's going to um, reduce our operational capabilities. We need to look at the commercial and general aviation terminals and ensure that those are not compromised and that in general, our airport certification standards as set by the, the federal government um, are applied. So who makes the decisions about the state of the airport? Well, airport management does and our director, Sunil Harmon. We make the decisions about airport safety based on the federal aviation regulations. And if defects or deficiencies are found uh, during these inspections, our responsibility is to immediately communicate those discrepancies via the notice to air mission system or the NOTAM system through the FAA. This lets all of the users of the national airspace system make informed decisions about whether to operate at BLI when non-standard conditions exist. And that's uh, really a, a general overview of the process. Um, if that critical damage does exist at the airport, the executive director, Rob Fix, will declare the state of emergency and we will begin the contracting uh, portion of any of those repairs. Um, and all of that will be overseen by our aeronautical engineers and our Port of Bellingham engineers. I'd like to keep it there because I'm really interested to see what questions you all have. So if you have any questions for me right now, I'd be more than happy to take those. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a question. Yes, ma'am. Well, I, I can just tell you from the Port of Bellingham, um, we would not be doing anything with those. Uh, those would be handled by the individual entities who are responsible for managing those, those airfields. How many people are dependent on the airport? There are a ton. Um, I, could, uh, I could point you to um, some um, open source materials online. Uh, Sky Vector, for instance, will bring up aeronautical charts, and you can see all of the private airports around, and it's a staggering number. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> okay, um, we're coming up, uh, got a little time left. Uh, what I'd like to do is, first of all, thank all the speakers for being here today and participating in this and bringing this uh, information to you. As I said in the beginning, uh, this is your information. We're just the conduits to get it to you, and hopefully it's helpful in your planning and the things that you do in your business as well as your employees. I mean, I want to make uh, one big point about that. Uh, preparedness buys government time to get the specialized people in to do the inspections to start to get things back up online and bring things back. If we don't have that time, and uh, then, uh, of course, that just makes the disaster worse. So when we're talking about preparedness, we're talking about two weeks' worth of preparedness. Uh, the video that I'm going to play next is going to kind of highlight that. It actually is a clip that was produced by one of the uh, uh, major networks down in Seattle, and it dealt with Cascadia 2016. So I think you'll get the message of that. Then we'll wrap up, 
And uh, I'll just say, if you have any questions or anything like that, uh, please email me, talk to us. We'll be here afterwards for a little while yet. Come up and ask us questions. Uh, get our email addresses, and I will uh, forward them out. If they don't get asked today and you think about it later, email me, and then we'll get that to the right person. So that being said, where's my... Yes. Correct. Thank you, Don. Uh, that uh, the comment had to deal with uh, the the preparation of the shelves, uh, things like that in our businesses, uh, our grocery stores. A lot of that will be empty. So uh, the preparedness side of that is having that on hand, food, water, to last you for that two week period. So once again, this video was from Cascadia, 2016. To figure out how to manage a record disaster requires the biggest drill in state history. We had a magnitude 9 earthquake off of our coast. From the state level down to county and city emergency operations centers, these people are among the first trying to get a handle on what just hit us. This is a drill. The message is Old Highway 99 at I-5. Old Highway 99 at I-5, mile marker 88. The bridge out on Yelm Highway is completely collapsed over the freeway there. And so it begins. The June 2016 exercise known as Cascadia Rising, designed to find out what works and what doesn't. An exercise that involves multiple local, tribal, state, and federal agencies. The Navy, um, Army, Coast Guard, Marines, a giant drill involving some 23,000 military and civilian personnel lasting for days. It's just there's so much more work to be done. Robert Izell is the state's emergency management director. Inculcating the message in our public dialogue, in our society, in our schools, so that the people who live here really truly get it, understand the gravity of the situation, and the need to take care of themselves. What led to Cascadia Rising was a 2011 study by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Further analysis by the Washington National Guard concluded that 8,440 people will be killed by the initial earthquake and tsunami. 12,114 will be injured. 507,000 buildings, homes, and apartments destroyed or damaged. Over one and a quarter million people will need food and water. The same for more than three-quarter of a million pets. Nearly a half million people will need emergency shelter. The worst of the worst would be sometime in the middle of uh, February where soils are, are saturated, it's cold, you have a winter storm coming in, you have uh, snow and ice on the ground. Cascadia Rising was set in June, the weather warmer, but earthquakes aren't tied to the weather. Odds are the quake will come when the weather is a lot less pleasant. Those saturated soils expected to become landslides, blocking roads and wiping out homes. Not unlike the 2014 Oso landslide, which killed 43, the deadliest landslide in U.S. history. Where you really truly have a massive humanitarian situation where you're trying to take care of people who don't have heat, they don't have water, they don't have food. The things that they need to just basically sustain life. It, uh, now, that's what really, really, truly gives me nightmares and keeps me up at night. Whether it's June or February, the ability for government to respond will simply be overwhelmed. So I was running sort of the, the guys that were running the exercise. Chris Fowler is a general in the Washington National Guard. 
He's also a captain in the Seattle Police Department. We would certainly like to see the public understand that uh, that preparedness is absolutely critical at their level. Why? Because Cascadia Rising was about finding flaws and gaps as well as building upon what worked and there was plenty of both. But the biggest finding was this, where governments have been recommending people be prepared to be on their own for three days simply isn't enough. What we're recommending is that they have two weeks of preparedness uh, for their families. Because it just became very crystal clear to us in a catastrophic event, it is vastly different from the disasters that we normally experience, the, the flooding, the wildland fires, or even this, the Nisqually type of earthquake. It's the infrastructure was still largely there following those type of events. After a catastrophic event, the infrastructure is gonna be severely degraded, if not inoperative. What you're seeing on this map is the status of roadways, airfields. It will take several days to get the National Guard in place, backed up by the U.S. military, pouring in personnel and supplies from out of state. We'll need them. Many of the first responders within that 24 to 72 hour period are just like you are. They're, they're trying to manage their families. They're trying to uh, stabilize their houses. They're trying to understand what their resources are. Uh, and then from there, they can transition into the first response uh, sort of job. Task Force Aviation Lakota, Shelton. Emergency management staff. There's going to be confusion. There's going to be um, a fog of information uh, until that sort of all clears out. And there will be some redundancies, but the idea of the exercise would be to minimize those and overcome that fog quicker than we might otherwise. Most of the transportation infrastructure west of I-5 suffers complete or severe damage. Ground transportation to the coast is cut off. The I-5 corridor from Bellingham to Portland suffers severe to moderate damage. 30% of the fire stations, 48% of police stations destroyed or out of commission. More than a third of hospitals on the west side of the state will be unusable, others damaged, almost half of western Washington's total hospital capacity lost. What long term we're looking at trying to build here in western Washington is that sense of self-reliance, the, the sense of the government isn't going to be here to help immediately. We have to be prepared to take care of ourselves for a period of time. It's not if, it's when. So they learned a lot from this one exercise, which was out of a total of nine days, but they want to learn more, build on what they learned here, and they're going to do this again in another four years to see what more information they can find out to make us that much safer and make us that much more realistic about what their capabilities are going to be. At Camp Murray, Glenn Farley, King 5 News, let me toss it back to Mark and Amanda. Okay, it was, it was six years between the exercises, but COVID was in there. <laughs> no, no, feel free, come on up. It is. Okay. <laughs> for those, uh, for the recording, I wanted to uh, just share this. Um, something to keep in mind is that today you saw a lot of information from a lot of people over a period of two hours, and you might be feeling, what do I do? Well, there is quite a bit you can do like we've shared, and there are resources to help you, but ultimately for yourselves and your family, and also the people that you work with or in your company, that is that first line of defense is that personal preparedness, and there are tools at the state that we have, your local and county emergency management, which you have folks here today, and there are some resources, I understand, that are over here. We are resources to talk to as well, but you noticed that there's a lot of, well, we have this person that's going to be inspecting this bridge. You know, we're going to inspect the tarmac, you know. Well, then there's people that have to take care of themselves first to be able to do those next steps. And that means that you're going to have to have those folks help you to continue that. Um, what I do want to mention, too, is that we've learned a lot since you saw this video. And you saw my director, uh, Robert Azell, talking about that. Um, and it does uh, ring true that we have a lot of work to do still. You know, we're still learning a lot. Um, and I, what I will say is that those numbers we already know that you saw in there are vastly underestimated. Uh, next year, we'll have a lot better understanding from the state. We're going to share more information uh, with our local, um, you know, local emergency management and county emergency management offices on those numbers. 
but taking all of this together and bringing it back to ask those difficult questions, to ask what are the mitigation plans, what are our response plans and things, and how can we uh, help as resources. But just wanted to add that one bit here. I'm really thankful for you uh, organizing this today, Wally. I know all of this would have not been possible without you sending that invitation. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, again, thank you all for coming. I have my closing on there. I won't go through it other than to say this is a journey. It's not an end. We hear this meeting today and we walk away. It's a journey working with each one of you. We're going to continue and there will be a point where we say let's come in together and bring people together to say what can we do as a group to put out information to the public and going back and making other businesses aware of this. That is so important that this was that first step that I mentioned. But the word has to get out to others. This is recorded, so people will be able to see it in the future. We need your help for that. I will just tell you that. So thank you for your time. I said 12 o'clock. I'm over. Have a great day. <laughs> uh, it's, it's mostly my fault, Wally. <laughs> not, not at all.